match with in 1945. America was the leading chess nation throughout the 30s. We won three Olympiads in a row. Uh, we played a radio match in 1945, in which we were slaughtered. And I think uh, Ruszewski wired the time. He, he lost his missile off very badly. And Ruszewski had taken an hour and a half or something, and he wired the time, I think the first 20 moves, and Smyslov had taken two minutes. Gives you an idea of how deep their opening analysis was, even in the 1940s. Uh, they suggested that the reason <coughs> the post war normalcy may be responsible. Chess is not only a game, it is a narcotic, cheap to play, and takes one's mind off politics and social questions. Uh, when I was in Yugoslavia in 1950, that was the first post-war Olympiad. I was only 18 then, and I was high scorer. Uh, a joke circulated that people played chess to forget their worries, and when they had no worries, they played chess because there was nothing else to do. In America, the Depression produced our finest players, and our five young players, who were in their 20s at the time, and our five veterans were in their 40s, the Soviets spared nothing to facilitate spectator interest. On stage, giant wall boards manned by young master candidates illustrated the position after each move as well as the time consumed by each player. My own four games with Bronstein, he had drawn a title match with Batvenik in 1951. And I, I had written a book about him. 1948 about his best game, so he was really my chess hero, uh, were tense and exciting. As I said before, we drew the first three, he won the second, uh, we drew the first, he won the second, we drew the third, and he escaped with the draw during a wild time scramble in the last game. If I have time, I'll get to the game, but I want to take some questions. Our team was put up at the Hotel National were several delegations from Communist China who were also being housed. Each morning a bus was sent to conduct us on a different tour to the Kremlin Museum, the Agricultural Fair, the Dynamo Stadium, and the Bolshoi Theater. I remember we saw, uh, strange to say, Swan Lake, and we got very good seats. Two interpreters were assigned to our group, but I never experienced the feeling of being uh, watched or followed. There was, however, an atmosphere of regimentation and monotony that hung heavily in the air. It was not until I reached sunny Stockholm to play against the Swedish team that I realized how profound my depression had been. Just leaving there was a weight lifted. Our interpreters were always dressed in the same suits. Our meals were always the same. The food was good and Russianized delicacies. There was sturgeon, ham, fried chicken, fish, caviar, cider, milk, and mineral water. Delicious, but always the same. The Soviet mind seems to function in a set pattern according to protocol. This sameness was particularly evident in the many speeches we heard, each extolling the value of the match in terms of international peace and the strengthening of cultural ties, blah, blah, blah. Often the very phraseology was identical in different speeches, probably to prevent speakers from deviating from the party line. When our team manager, Rasa Reeves, who, by the way, was the head of an advertising agency at the time. I think he came up. Brush your teeth with Pepsodent, and you'll wonder where the yellow went. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, oh, cool, cool, cool. Remember that? Those annoying ads? Well, he was the brain. He was the brainchild behind that stuff. Um, said on the first day that he hoped the Soviets and the Americans would meet in no greater contest than chess in the next 10,000 years, and he got a resounding ovation. Everything was so politically correct. The
hospitality of our hosts was incomparable. They did everything possible to make our stay pleasant. We received the red carpet treatment, and they even gave each of us 120 rubles for spending money. <coughs> rubles versus dollars. The entire subject of money and buying power is very complex. This is because the official rate of exchange at the time was four rubles to the dollar. Fantastically unrealistic. I don't know what it is today. I don't know. I understand that on the Tel Aviv free market, rubles were selling for 20 to the dollar, a much more reasonable yardstick. At the black market rate of a nickel a ruble, Oranges cost $1.40 a piece. A dish of caviar, 60 cents. A cup of tea, 15 cents. A striped shirt, $6. A Mickey Mouse type watch or women's high heeled shoes, $19.25. And a motorcycle, $119.50. Compare that with today. Uh, while those prices were not fantastically out of line with those in the U.S., it's important to realize that the average monthly salary in the USSR for a six-day, 48-hour week is $40, less than $10 a week. For most Russians, however, the income does not imply the same poverty-stricken conditions that they do here. Most necessities are far cheaper than anything Americans know. For example, it's possible to obtain living quarters for as little as 50 cents a month. Medicine is also very inexpensive. I saw eyeglasses for 30 cents being fitted by trial and error in a drugstore, and prescriptions could be filled for less than a ruble. Many items regarded as necessities by Americans, such as several changes of clothing, are considered luxuries by the Russians. The most familiar dresses are flower print cotton, which sharply contrast with the men's dark, durable, regimented patterns. I learned that light colors, because they stain so easily, are the distinguishing marks of important people. Automobiles are rare, and since the rural roads were so poor, confined almost exclusively to the cities. In Moscow, most of the vehicles were Soviet-made cars resembling 1952 Packards. Occasionally, a chauffeur-driven official Cadillac or Chevrolet passed with drawn green curtains. And you knew there was somebody important in it when you saw that. <coughs> It's almost impossible to compare purchasing power in the U.S. and Russia. In addition to the problem of determining true costs, those not twisted out of proportion by supply and demand, Soviet favoritism complicates the picture even further. In many cases, talented individuals like ballet dancers may attain a sumptuous apartment for the same rent that a sanitation worker pays for a hovel. Private, privacy, as we know it, is virtually non-existent, just the way it's getting here. An American reporter told me that the average living space was six and a half yards a person. Thus, a four-room apartment might house about 20 people. I was struck by the fact that the entire Soviet economy was governed by political expediency. Uh, this was most apparent in the case of books and printed matter. This material for which the state can best propagandize is devilishly cheap. Despite this, however, the people themselves are quite outspoken, not half so petrified of the secret police as we assume. For the most part, the Russians were not only curious, but quite friendly. When I asked an injudicious question through my interpreter, I received only a tolerant smile. In fact, one thing impressed me above all. The Russia hate in our country vastly exceeds any America hate in the USSR. I found that the contact between Russians and foreigners was very limited. 
and that few Russians had ever been outside of their own border. In this light, some of their distortions led by a one-party press are understandable to an American, if not totally amusing. They think, for example, that bail is a means by which a rich man can buy himself out of prison time. I tried to explain that he can only buy freedom while awaiting trial, because we think a man is innocent until proven guilty. They think that discrimination and segregation are widespread in America. They are violently aroused by tales of Negro baiting and lynching. A book by Howard Fast called Peekskill USA, which is highly inflammable propaganda, is available in every bookstore that I saw. The Russian speaker, people I spoke with thought of the typical American as self-centered, money-loving, and culturally materialistic. They viewed the U.S. as the Cold War aggressor. For example, several of them pointed to the Marshall Plan, the rearming of Germany, and the ring of U.S. bases in Europe as evidence of active hostility towards Russia. I gather it's their view that the people of America essentially want peace, but there are certain warmongering circles provoking war. All believe that both the Republican and Democratic parties are parties of, quote, the upper classes. Uh, what was it that Gordy Dow once said? He said, there's only one party in America, it's the business party. <laughs> When I said that Lenin himself had written that communism and capitalism could not exist side by side, they replied that those words had been written around 1921 and time had changed their meaning. They told me they felt a war to defeat capitalism would be unnecessary, that capitalism is a rotten apple that will fall even if the tree is not shaken. The Russian man on the street convinced me that he wants disarmament. When I said the USSR had rejected the Baruch plan for nuclear disarmament, they said they read that it was America that had turned down a similar Soviet proposal. I discovered that the Russian people have implicit faith in their press. Every word printed in Pravda is regarded as the truth. They think of themselves as democratic and free. And it was impossible for me to convince them that a multi-party system with the choice of different candidates in an election is superior to their one-party system. Their setup functions very much like a democratic primary <coughs> in the South in those days, where the candidate who is nominated invariably wins. The fight takes place within the party, at least in theory. The Russians were impressed only when I spoke of the material goods possessed by the average American worker. They were agog when I said that a man can pack up and quit whenever he wants and travel from New York to California without permission. Freedom of movement is unknown here. Each citizen carries a permit to live, quote unquote, quote, permit to live and must receive official sanction before leaving his city. Even this is not viewed as an infringement of their liberty. Your life is planned, they said. Each worker is important in place. Never having had freedom as we know it, they don't miss its blessings. I fear the essential difference in our ways of thinking concerns the relation of the individual to the state. The Soviets cannot conceive of individualism and the pursuit of pleasure, which is viewed as egotism and license rather than liberty. They hold that an individual finds his greatest fulfillment when subordinated to the mass or state. Tell that to Ayn Rand. When I asked why criticism of the government was forbidden, they replied that their solidarity was their strength. It's difficult for one schooled in the liberal tradition to understand those sentiments. They believe that their leaders are genuinely working for the good of their people, 
and try 